Um, my name is Ana Perez. I'm one of your new co-chairs of Austin DSA. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and as always, we have a really solid lineup of organizers ready to talk about all of the exciting work going on in our chapter and across the country today. So all of the links and information can be found in the agenda, um, which we will put another link in the chat. Um, but so just don't feel like you have to keep up with all of the sign up links. Um, they're all there for you. Um, and we also have an excellent Google calendar where you can find all of our upcoming events. Um, and you can conveniently add it to your calendar as well. Um, but yeah, so this month has marked one year of living through the COVID crisis, um, a crisis in which half a million people have needlessly died while those in power have done the absolute least to ensure that people could safely stay at home. In fact, as tens of millions remain jobless, the stock market is reaching all-time highs and billionaires are lining their pockets. The promise that these riches will eventually trickle down to the masses is farcical considering the fact that an additional 8 million Americans have been cast into poverty over the course of this crisis. We saw politicians lavish disingenuous praise on essential workers, while at the same time lifting mask mandates, denying service workers priority vaccines, and opposing basic worker rights to organize by voting against the Protect the Right to Organize Act. Over the past month, we've seen the Biden administration fail to close detention camps at the border. We saw Kamala Harris refuse to use her powers in the Senate to override the parliamentarian and include a $15 minimum wage in the COVID relief bill. And we, we saw that the Democratic Party is not equipped to combat mass shootings um, like the ones in Atlanta and Boulder. Um, our own Texas legislature is debating pitiful police reforms that do the bare minimum and bills preempting cities from implementing paid sick leave instead of reconfiguring our energy system after a catastrophic winter storm left millions in the cold. And although we face a million and one heartbreaking, infuri infuriating and inhumane realities every day, our movement is stronger than it's been in decades. We have almost 100,000 DSA comrades across the country and even more workers who are ready to fight the bosses and take power from the capitalist class. As socialists, we know that there are no shortcuts to building working class power. And um, we know that collectively we can overcome austerity and redirect our resources to projects that will benefit our communities like a Green New Deal. The PRO Act could reverse some of the most anti-worker legislation on the books and our organizing efforts, like the national phone banks all over the calendar that you can sign up for, not only show the working class whose side we're on, they also give our newer comrades the skills and confidence to do the hard work of building our movement. So tonight we'll hear from comrades doing electoral work, labor organizing, an important local campaign to defeat anti-poor criminalization of homelessness. Uh, if you can, turn on your camera. We love to see your beautiful faces and make it feel um, more like the community we had before the pandemic. Um, and we love reactions. So, you know, the reactions um, are just in the bottom right hand corner. You can, there you go, uh, jazz fingers. And uh, we love to pump each other up in the people's chat. Um, so yeah, with, uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to our comrade from East Bay. Uh, Molly Armstrong to tell us about her journey as a socialist going back to school to become a nurse and become a rank and file union activist. Hi everyone, my name is Molly and my pronouns are she and her. Um, thank you so much for the lovely introduction and thank you. I'm so humbled to be, uh, look at all of your beautiful little boxes. Um, and so I'm just gonna start a timer because I could talk about nursing for very long, um, but I'll leave a couple minutes just in this time in case I don't cover something, something's not clear, you have questions. Um, but I just wanted to, um, I was asked to speak with you all um, particularly about as Anna said, uh, going back to school for nursing with the intention of kind of implementing uh, kind of a rank and file uh, strategy in my own life and in the broader socialist movement. Um, so 
Well, here it goes. Um, a little bit about me is um, I'm currently in Oakland, California. I've lived here for about seven years, but before this, um, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up largely apolitical, like very in a conservative household, conservative region, but like basically apolitical. Um, and so I honestly didn't know about the labor movement. I didn't know about socialism. I didn't know about any of that. Um, and so I went to, and I also, I think like many people, maybe you relate to this. Um, I kind of grew up with this idea of what getting a job like successfully looks like. And it had to do with making enough money. Uh, I don't know what enough was, but enough of it. Um, being in a prestigious position, um, hopefully you could do good in the world along the way, but really like finding the perfect job to fit the perfect snowflake that was you that will like tickle all of your special little specialness um, and trying to figure out what that looked like. And so about a decade ago, I went to a very prestigious undergrad school thinking like I'm doing all the things I should do, didn't know, didn't know what that really looked like. I got a degree in English right after the recession, which was not really helpful. Um, and so I spent the last decade, thank you, yes, labor notes. Um, I spent the last decade really searching for what that was. I worked in nonprofits, I worked in publishing, nannying, a personal assistant to some very wealthy people to see, oh my gosh, how the actual ruling class lives. Um, and I, I tried some, um, my time in academia for a little while, and I just didn't know. I, especially in nonprofits, I was under this impression after working for really wealthy people, I'm like, oh my God, I really wanna do good. And I couldn't figure out what doing good meant. And so I was working in nonprofits and it felt so demoralizing, honestly, because here we were writing grants, asking for people to give us money from these foundations that got their money from really devious means. And then we're gonna do this work that's not gonna change the system, but I'm gonna put a bandaid on it. Meanwhile, making those wealthy people feel good about themselves. It was really messed up. Um, and, and then same with academia, at least for me, it felt so far removed. I was at Berkeley at the time when Trump got elected uh, in 2016, and it just felt so removed from like what is happening on the ground. Um, and not to diss anyone in, in academia or nonprofits, um, I know that we're all trying to figure it out and maybe it's like really working for you. But for me, I just felt so detached from um, feeling powerful. I didn't think that was an option from feeling like things could really change. Um, and then I discovered Bernie Sanders and democratic socialism and my life totally changed. Um, so I joined DSA election night 2016 um, because I just felt like something had to change and I didn't know what it was. I showed up to the next meeting that week and honestly, things just totally changed from there. I got involved in DSA at a time when it was swelling um, and just learning so many tools that I never had before, how to facilitate a meeting, how to put on a campaign, how to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, no one's taught that typically, right? Like that's an unusual thing, unless you're like in like, I don't know, corporate management or something. Um, and so the, all of those tools that DSA was giving me, meanwhile, political education, learning about the labor movement, learning about, you know, this idea of um, collective action to, to make demands from those in power and to really, um, you know, to make those demands and then win them. Um, and so about a year went by and some other DSA members and I, we're figuring out like, you know, what are we gonna do? Should we like become union staffers? Um, how do we like really embed ourselves to, to create like a political life for ourselves? And, um, and then I spoke with a lot of people in unions, in labor, things like that. And I realized like, no, if I wanna be, if I, if I believe that the working class is agent of change, then I wanna be in the working class and I wanna be of the working class. And so I decided to go back to school for nursing. Um, and just to give a little plug about nursing, because I had never considered it before. I mean, back when I was like young, my parents, like they're blue collar and they're like, yeah, nursing's great. And I was like, I ah, know, I'm going to go be like a doctor or something like that, right? Again, this like prestige mindset. Um, and so nursing, nursing, there are so many nurses out there and everyone knows a nurse. I promise you, somewhere you know a nurse somehow, right? And at some point, you're going to have to interact with a nurse whether from the day you were born to the day you die, nurses will be there. 
And so um, for me, that was just really eye-opening. And there's so much power in the, the fact that there's so many of us and we're at the forefront of the provisioning of our very broken healthcare system. So my dream is that we're gonna bring this like socialist leftist lens to this movement and be able to actually demand that Medicare for all that we all not just deserve, but then we can have the power to demand. Um, and so that's my dream for being in nursing. But um, also for me, it's job security. It's benefits that I didn't have before. It's like being the flexibility to go to any state and be able to work there. It's um, so many like great opportunities that like working in nonprofits I didn't have. I was making $45,000 in a nonprofit in San Francisco over half of my take home pay going to rent. That wasn't working, right? And so it's also a really good job um, and it's different in every state and right to work states are different and everything like that, but it's a really uh, flexible, great job that I would love if anyone's interested in particular, I can put my like information in the um, chat. If you guys are seriously thinking about it or interested, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, even if you're just toying with it, but I just wanna like zoom back out a little bit. I went to, so I, I decided to go to nursing school I spent a year doing prereqs. I, in 2018, started nursing school as a two-year program as a because of second bachelor's degree. I just graduated in December. I just started my first registered nursing job yesterday. Um, but because of COVID, um, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I've actually been working as a nurse last summer and over the winter in COVID, um, over the summer at a uh, COVID nursing home and then this past winter on a COVID unit. Um, and so really seeing firsthand, um, it was a for-profit nursing uh, home over the summer. So like really seeing the CD underbelly um, of our healthcare system was really eye-opening and also confirmed for me that I wanna be doing this. Um, not because that, that was great. It was a very honestly horrific job, but because I realized how much potential is there everyone that you're working with knows that that's messed up and everyone there wants to provide better for their um, patients. And that's really powerful. And that's just so ripe for organizing um, for those larger demands, right? Beyond our wages and things, but it's like for the community demands that we all deserve so much more. Um, and so I, uh, oh, let me just see, I just wanna make sure I hit all the points. Um, so yeah, I just started my actual official registered nursing job yesterday. I am now official labor and delivery nurse, which is what I wanted to do, um, bringing new life into the world. I'm so excited. Um, but I also wanted to say that, um, you know, I know, I recognize that not everyone will probably go become a nurse, right? Um, if you're toying with it, I would suggest just shadowing a nurse, talking to them about it. And I'll also say that for all of you that your first reaction is, oh, I'm afraid of blood. I understand everyone says that, everyone says that sounds terrible, but trust me, all of those skills you learn and they fade into the background. And the most important part is that you get to be there during a really intimate time in people's lives where you're providing a skill set that's super necessary. It's life-changing, it's really amazing. Um, and, uh, and there's so much, there's so many different types of nursing, right? If you're adrenaline junkie, you can work in the emergency room. If you love babies, you can be in the NICU. Um, but, and also the other thing that people, I have talked to a lot of people about this is the idea of going back to school, whether it's nursing or teaching or something that will require school. I know that for some people that's, that's inhibitive, inhibitory, right? Um, I get that, I'm in my thirties. Um, it was a hard decision. But I will say the other component of that is like life keeps going on. And I was able to participate in DSA the entire time. I played a really large role in our Oakland teachers strike support. I was part of our um, strike support for our local healthcare union. And so I'm still building out all of those tools that are really gonna serve me when I start to do union organizing work throughout the whole time of going to school. Um, and because things like teaching and nursing are such large fields that like need more people in. There's a lot of ways to make it work through community college, scholarship programs, things like that, to like really find your way. And believe me, working class people, they have figured out how to make all of those things work. So all of your classmates, they're gonna be telling you, you can get this grant, you can do this thing, like they're, you can really make it work um, if like money and things like that are kind of on your, uh, the forefront of trying to figure this out. 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to say, if I still haven't sold you on joining me as a nurse, you don't have to industrialize. The whole root of the rank and file strategy is to animate the working class to feel their power and make larger demands and then win those demands from those in power, right? And so the example I gave you of the Oakland teacher strike, our chapter East Bay supported that the teachers and said, we know that this fight is gonna be big and we know that's important. We wanna figure out how to support you. You take the lead and tell us what you need. And all of our chapter members figured out whether it's you need to be trained on how to canvas, we'll train you on the canvas and then we'll help canvas. And we showed up to the strike, we showed up to the picket line, things like that, that like, that is the rank and file strategy. You are empowering the working class to make those demands, that's huge. And so figuring out like as a chapter, what that looks like, you don't have to go be a nurse or a teacher if you don't want to, um, but it's still a huge thing to like really, uh, I think be there as a community member and support in that way. Um, I think I'm at time, at my time. So I'll end it there. Um, and just the final thought for me at least was just re-envisioning what it means to be successful or a political agent in your own life. I'm in mean, reconsidering what it means to get a career, a political career. And for me, that nursing is an example of that. There's so much potential. Um, and again, I just wanna say, if you're thinking about being nursing or anything in the healthcare field, I'm gonna my contact information in the chat, definitely reach out to me. I've talked to lots of people who are thinking about this. Maybe we can find someone closer to you that you could shadow or something like that. Um, but I would love to talk to anyone if they're interested in it. And I think there's a few minutes left maybe they take a question or two if Anna thinks that's okay. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope I convinced at least one of you to do it, the two to do it together. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, we are running a little short on time. So I'm going to say we will take one question from the chat if there is one. Um, and if not, uh, I totally, if you're thinking about this, I definitely recommend reaching out. Um, I know we have a lot of uh, DSA comrades who went into electrician work. Um, after joining DSA, so. Um, all right, well, if you don't, if no one has any questions, then I'm going to say thank you again, Molly. That was uh, so inspiring and congratulations. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to um, our own elected official, um, Jose Garza. We went all in to elect him to DA um, and we're all very excited about the work that his office is doing, so. We'll hear some updates about that. Hi, Anna. Hi, everyone. It's really, really good to, to see you all. Um, and I feel like I begin every, um, every visit with you the same way, which is to tell you I miss all of you and can't wait till we can um, get a beer together in person or soda water, whichever is your fancy. Um, I wanted to just spend a, a few minutes this evening um, if I can, just reflecting a little bit on, on the struggle that we have been through together. Um, talking a little bit about, you know, what, what the results of that struggle were and what they are as we sit here together and um, closing in on April of 2021. And I want to talk a little bit about, um, about the struggle ahead, about the fight that's in front of us. Um, you know, we started this journey, it feels like 18 or, or 24 months ago, I can't even remember. Um, and when we did, you know, we, we talked a lot collectively about the fact that our criminal justice system here in Travis County um, was broken. And, you know, in our efforts um, in neighborhoods, at, at doors, at rallies, we let folks know exactly what that meant that right here in the most progressive county in the state, um, that 9% of our population is black, but close to 30% of the population of our jail is black. We talked about the fact that on any given day here in Travis County, over 70% of people sitting in our jail had not been convicted of a crime, that per capita, uh, Travis County had more people incarcerated um, sitting in jail in New York. Um, we, we talked about the fact that 
Um, every year, our district attorney's office prosecuted more drug cases than any other kind of offense um, that that office worked on. And we talked about the fact that prosecuting low-level drug offenses, um, number one, made our community less safe because every day we know this, every day a person who is struggling with substance use stays in jail, the likelihood that they'll commit another crime goes up. Um, and we knew that spending our resources prosecuting um, low-level drug offenses was one of the greatest drivers of racial disparities in our criminal legal system. We talked about the fact that, um, as I said, 9% of the population is black, but 30% of all drug arrests in Travis County were of members of the black community. We talked about the fact that um, over 60% um, of people who were pulled over for traffic stops and arrested for drug possession were people of color, even though people of color don't make up 60% of Travis County. And about the fact that um, traffic stops were the number one way that people were stopped and arrested for drug possession. We talked about all of that and the fact that um, on top of that, that we were living in a community where survivors of sexual assault um, felt like they had lost trust in our criminal legal system, felt like they were not heard, um, like they weren't believed. We talked about the fact that, um, that every year, you know, over the last four years, a member of our community had been hurt or killed by, um, by law enforcement. And that over the course of those four years, not a single law enforcement officer had been held accountable for that violence against our community. Um, we talked about the fact that every day, not just here in Austin, but certainly across the state and across the country, um, we know that there are people um, sitting in our jail who have been through our criminal legal system, who have been convicted of crimes, who are actually innocent um, every single day. And we talked about the fact that, um, you know, as a community, we deserved better and we demanded better. So um, that was the state of justice in Travis County when we began this struggle 18 or 24 months ago. But we also talked about the fact that it didn't have to be that way. Uh, we talked about the power that, that we had as regular people um, to organize, to activate our neighbors, to activate our friends, to engage people in our political process, um, to take back power, to determine for ourselves what justice should look like, what justice should mean right here in the most progressive county in the state. Uh, and that's exactly what, what all of you did. Um, you exercised your power, I think, in a way that this community had not seen um, and maybe even wasn't prepared for. I, I think collectively, you guys knocked on, somebody will, will check this, but over 100,000 doors or something like that um, pre-pandemic um, while we could still get out in neighborhoods. Um, you made tens of thousands of phone calls and you fueled a grassroots movement in our community um, to reshape and to take back our, uh, our criminal legal system and so much more. But um, you put so much work, so much effort um, into, into this movement, um, into this struggle together for a more just community. Um, and because you did, um, you know, on election night, we won going away. Together, uh, we beat a sitting incumbent with over 70% of the vote. Um, someone who was 
who was of the political machine in Travis County. And you did that, um, each and every one of you, with the work you put into it, with the courage that you showed, that was the result of your struggle. But, and, and let, me, let me just add that um, you did that in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you did that while, while many of you were out of jobs, um, while, while many of you, you know, were living in um, extreme anxiety about the health and safety of your friends and family. Um, you showed up every single day to make phone calls, um, to get out the word. You, you continued the struggle even in the midst of real and unrelenting struggle. And, and all of that effort brought us to this moment when, you know, in January, we could take office and begin um, to build the criminal justice system that we know we deserved. And so we, um, you know, we foreshadowed throughout the course of that struggle what that criminal justice system would look like. We talked openly and honestly about the change that we needed to see, that we demanded to see, and that we would realize together. Obviously, our struggle isn't over. Uh, we have so much work ahead of us. But I do want to give you just a little bit of an update on the results of your struggle, um, on, on what, your, um, what your struggle, um, be, because we have a nurse with us today, what your struggle birthed here in Travis County. Um, because of your efforts, let's, let's start with, with cash bail. Um, in March of April of last year, the jail population in Travis County, as I said, um, was larger as a percentage than the jail population of New York City. Um, it was sitting at somewhere on a daily basis of around 22 or 2300 people on any, any given day somewhere around 2,200 people were sitting in our jail. As we sit here today, um, well, well, let me just mention that we um, instituted a new policy um, and it was pretty radical on, uh, on April 1st, we in instituted a new radical policy. And that policy was to say that um, no one who does not pose a threat to our community should be sitting in jail simply because they can't afford to get out. Pretty crazy stuff, huh? Um, and by implementing that radical policy, as we sit here today, um, our jail population is hovering around 1,500 on a daily basis um, and dropping every day. So let's, let's do this again in, in a couple of months and let's see where we are. Um, but we're not done yet. We're, we're just getting started um, ending the scourge of cash bail in our community. And let me just say a word about, about why. Um, obviously because it's unjust. Obviously because um, it just flies in the face of everything we know is right, that a person should sit in jail because they don't have enough money to get out. Um, but also because cash bail makes us less safe. When you separate working people from their jobs and their families, simply because they can't afford to, to, to pay the toll to get out of jail, it means that they are less likely to keep their job. They are less likely to be able to make payments on their car, on their house, on their apartment. It means that they are not able um, to care for and provide for their family. And what all of those things collectively equal is instability. Instability in that person's life, in that family's life, in that neighborhood. And instability is what makes us less safe. So, so that is where we are um, on cash bail. Um, the minute we took office in January, um, we ended the prosecution of low level drugs in this county. And we were clear, we were honest, we were transparent 
about what that meant throughout the course of our campaign. Um, what it meant was that we would end the prosecution of possession and sale offenses of a gram or less, regardless of the substance. Because again, um, prosecuting low level drug offenses makes us less safe. Uh, I, have, um, I have family members in my, in my family, like many of you do, who have struggled with substance use disorder. Um, and if you, if you know someone, if maybe you yourself have struggled with substance use disorder, you know um, that it's not, it's not something that you can jail your way out of. Um, I don't know a single person who, who struggled with substance use disorder who overcame it because they were incarcerated or threatened with incarceration. That's just not how it works. Um, you know, there's real um, science at work here, and um, that's just not how the science works. And, and as I said, what we know is that when you incarcerate people who are struggling with substance use disorder, it makes it more likely that they will commit another crime. That makes us less safe. Um, so we have ended the prosecution of low-level drug offenses here in Travis County. Um, we set out from, from the beginning of our time in office to build the criminal justice system where survivors of sexual assault are believed and treated with dignity and respect. Um, you know, I've learned a few things since I started this job. And one of the things I learned is that at the end of the day, what our criminal justice system is, is people. It is each and every one of you. It is the people who serve on our juries and grand juries. Um, it is the, the people who make up our office at the Travis County District Attorney's Office, people like uh, my good friend, Dominic Silvera, who is that way on my screen. Um, what our criminal justice system is, is people. And so when it came to building a criminal justice system that treated survivors with dignity and respect, um, we built an office filled with people um, who did that radical thing. And so I was so excited that we hired Aaron Martinson, um, who you may remember was um, at one point my opponent um, during the election, but always my friend um, who cares deeply about this issue, who um, has given all of her, her life and her career to fighting for survivors, um, now runs the unit charged with, with prose prosecuting um, sexual assault. Um, we hired a world-class nationally recognized um, leader in, in trauma, um, uh, victim witness counselor to lead um, the people in our office who are responsible for making sure that, um, that survivors are treated with dignity and respect in our office. Um, and I'm so proud of, of the work they're doing. Um, this is a little bit in the weeds, but we returned um, to the sexual assault response and resource team, which was a, a collaborative of survivors and law enforcement that met regularly um, to deal with the crisis of sexual assault in our community. The prior administration um, refused to work with that group um, and, and we have been back since day one. Um, I've said all along and, and each and every one of you did as well, um, that in order for us to be safe as a community, we have a responsibility to hold law enforcement officers accountable when they break the law. Um, if we do not, then as a community, we rightfully lose trust in our criminal justice system. And that makes all of us less safe. Um, it means that people are less willing um, to participate, to, to be a witness. Um, and it also means that there are people who are above the law if we don't hold law enforcement accountable. And how can we be safe if there are some people the law just won't touch? So um, since we took office, um, 
And I think we have indicted um, over four, at least four um, law enforcement officers um, for criminal conduct, um, two for aggravated assault in a case that um, Austin Police Department had inexplicably cleared. Um, and you may have seen that, that a Travis County grand jury um, last week um, handed down an indictment on a charge of first degree murder um, against the, the officer who shot Mike Ramos. Um, we have, those cases are not over. Um, and the hard, hardest part is yet to come. But what I want you to know is that we are committed to establishing that in this community, in our community, no one is above the law. Um, that regardless of your job, regardless of your title, um, regardless of how much privilege or wealth you may have, if you harm a member of this community, you will be held accountable. Um, in, in that vein, I was incredibly excited um, in April to launch um, our first ever um, economic justice strategic enforcement initiative. Um, what does that mean? It's a lot of gobbledygook, but let me tell you what it means. Um, it means that if you commit a crime that makes it hard for working people in this town, um, if you commit a crime that destabilizes working communities, you will be held accountable. Um, if you commit wage theft in Travis County, um, we will prosecute you. Um, if you um, run a business in which the, the health and safety conditions on your job site are so abhorrent that they lead to serious bodily injury or death, because you don't take your responsibility seriously to keep people safe, we will prosecute you. Um, so again, we're, we're just getting started. We have a lot of work to do, um, but it's part of our, of, of our shared commitment, of the commitment that we all fought for uh, on doors and in phone calls and at rallies um, that in this system, um, powerful actors will not get a free pass. Uh, the last thing I want to mention before I, I take up all of your time um, is we we talked about, you know, and I, I talked about earlier the fact that um, that there are far too many people every day, and mostly people without without means, without privilege, without wealth, um, who are victim to our criminal legal system, who are actually innocent. We know it happens every day, it happens far too often. Um, here in Texas. And we talked about the fact that in other places across the country, that there were district attorney's offices um, that took seriously their responsibility um, to, to, to seek out and to find innocence in our system. Um, you know, the, the district attorney's office in, in Philadelphia has exonerated 18 people or something like that in, in, in Baltimore, the district attorney has exonerated 12 people. Um, you know, here in Travis County, over the last four years, we had exonerated no one. And we know that there are people sitting in our jail who are innocent. And so I was uh, incredibly humbled uh, and grateful to have the opportunity, um, I, I think, in the month of January, um, to, to be a part of freeing Rosa Jimenez, um, uh, a woman who was undocumented, um, who had been accused, who had been prosecuted um, for the death of a toddler, um, and of whom four judges had said that she was likely innocent um, of the charges against her. And she sat in jail for 15 years. Um, and a month ago, because of your work, because of your struggle, um, she was able to attend uh, her daughter's wedding. So our work is not done. Um, and, and the fight ahead is only going to be um, more brutal, more vicious, more difficult. Um, you know, the, the police union has already taken um, 
to lying about what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, we're only going to see the rhetoric ratchet up um, with every month that passes, with every change we make, with every promise we keep. And so I want to just um, talk a little bit about that fight for just 30 more seconds, and I promise, and I'll, I'll give it back over. Um, but many of you know that part of the way this struggle started is because you came together to knock on doors, to talk to your neighbors, um, and to ask our community to stand with you, to stand with us, and to stand with people experiencing homelessness um, against the criminalization of homelessness. And because of your, your struggle, you scored a massive victory. And our city council um, eliminated the, the laws that made it a crime um, to, to be homeless in our community. But, you know, there are people um, who have invested their entire lives and ideology in the idea that what public safety is, is locking up as many low-income people, as many working class people, as many poor people, and as many people of color as they can. Um, what The lie that they tell us is that if we want to feel safe, that's what we have to do. Just lock up as many working class people and people of color as we can. We know that's not true. Um, someone put in the chat, and I won't do it justice, but we know that what public safety is, is access to a good job. It's access to housing. It's access to health care. It's access to good schools to send our children. What public safety is, is stability. Um, as soon as you make progress in this community, um, never doubt for a second that there will be um, well-resourced efforts marshaled to claw that progress back. And so on the ballot this May is an initiative to undo the work you have done, um, to take us back and to criminalize people experiencing homelessness. Um, I have signed up, um, and I, I hope I always do, but um, for the forces of good on this one, um, I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Um, I intend to show up and phone bank with you, um, and I hope that, that you will continue your struggle with us um, to make sure that they don't take us back. Because if they succeed this time, um, they will only be more emboldened the next time. So um, thank you again for, for everything all of you do. Um, I'm humbled to be your district attorney. And if Anna says we can, I'm, I'm happy to take a question or two. Um, thank you so much, Jose. That was so inspiring. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we're so grateful that you came and spoke with us. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to support you and everyone in your office and the work that y'all are doing. Um, unfortunately, y'all, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to um, put the chair foot down and say we're going to keep going because we have a lot on the agenda today. Um, but a big, huge round of applause for Jose. Um, we're, you know, it's so inspiring. And I think having people like you in office is a really great way to see how we as socialists can take power and do good things for our community. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us. Um, next, we're gonna have a quick con DSA convention um, reminder um, from Dave Pinkham. You're here. Thanks, Anna. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, cool. My computer sucks, so I never know anymore. Hey, Reds. Uh, Dave Pinkham, he, him. Uh, I'm a trade unionist, member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 520 here in Austin. Like Molly, I am recently embarked on a journey into a new rank and file job. I'm also a member of DSA's National Political Committee. And I just wanna say real quickly before I go on to talk about uh, the convention that how great and what an honor it is to speak after uh, both uh, 
a fellow socialist trade unionist and a really great elected uh, who we fought alongside of like Jose as a reminder to all of us that uh, this is one struggle that we're all a part of the trade union movement, the fight against our horrible, oppressive and racist system of incarceration. These are not separate struggles. Uh, you know, we live in a society where the ruling class has catastrophically, you know, not failed and do it on purpose, right? But they refuse to give us the things that we need to have a dignified life. And their response to the crisis that that creates in society is a vicious, you know, attack on working class people where they round us up and throw us in jail. And as we all know, this weighs even more heavily on black and brown working class people. Um, and so this is one fight. Um, and so like, I say all that to say like one of the big things that we're talking about as we go into the 2021 DSA National Convention, uh, which is going to be at the beginning of August, uh, is a presentation of what DSA is all about. We're working to build a political program, a political platform uh, for the first time, really, as uh, the organization for the organization as it exists now. Um, if you read your NPC newsletter, which I'm sure you all read it. <laughs> I can see all the faces. So I'll share a link to the text of what I'm going to talk about here, which has some updates about the convention in it. But I'm going to mostly talk about the platform in this couple minutes, and then we'll just touch on the other stuff as well. So this platform process is really sort of an effort to build a uh, the greatest possible level of unity amongst our members and also for us to have a collective political education process of you know working together to understand what it is we're fighting for um, and so as such in that npc newsletter uh, and in the link that i shared in the chat uh, we sent out like a first draft of this platform uh, this first draft has been developed by uh, the plot excuse me the platforms and resolution subcommittee, which is part of the whole convention planning process. So this is a couple chaired by myself and another member of the NPC, the National Political Committee, and is made up of some volunteers who were appointed by the NPC. The purpose of this uh, first draft is basically to sort of, to the best of our ability, aggregate and synthesize and um, basically, you know, sort of all the things that DSA is fighting for and do it in a way that is also not so long that no one will ever read it. Uh, so that's a tension that exists in this platform, right? Like if it's too long, it's gonna be useless, but if it's too short, we'll never be able to say all the horrible things that happen in this world because of capitalism and why we want and how we wanna fix them. So this draft is a first draft. Included in that draft is a, uh, a request for your responses. We want you to take a look and let us know what you think so that we can incorporate this in, into it as we move toward the second draft. Uh, part of this is also working with our national working groups and committees to, you know, for like, you know, the sort of national campaigns and various areas of work to get their feedback as well. And the goal will be to basically bring a second draft and then for that draft to like, you know, be part of a process of formal discussion. We're going to have uh, a bunch of meetings before the convention that are going to be open to all members uh, where you can join in and talk about not just the platform, but since I'm talking about that, you know, talk about why a socialist organization should have a platform, what it means, what its purpose is, what, you know, what we hope for it to do, and then to drill down into some of the, you know, nitty gritty, especially, you know, everyone won't be able to talk about every part, but we're going to set it up to make it possible to where you can talk about as much of it as as is possible in a reasonable amount of time because you know we only have so much time um and through that time frame there's going to be also an open window for a submission of formal amendments to the platform as proposed uh, and that information is contained in the link i said the only the other things that ought to be shared right now are um, we're also now in uh, the open window of uh, accepting resolutions that are not related to the, to the platform specifically to the 2021 convention. Uh, resolutions can cover, you know, a wide variety of things, including like how the SA should engage strategically uh, or tactically in the work that we do, uh, you know, what the national organization should do with our collective resources. Uh, you know, sometimes 
controversial issues around labor strategy. That's what was a big one at the last convention. Uh, and also uh, whether or not we should, uh, you know, vote to change our national constitution and bylaws, which is a little bit more boring, but uh, also potentially important. Uh, that submissions window is open right now and goes until April 15th. Um, the, the submissions window for the platform process will be much further till the end of June. Um, those are the main things I wanted to share. Um, before too long, and I forget the exact dates offhand, but chapter leadership will know, I uh, will we'll be uh, entering the time where chapters will nominate delegates to go and represent the chapter at the national convention. So that means any of you as members of Austin DSA could, if you feel so moved, uh, run to represent Austin at the, at the national convention. Uh, we're a pretty big chapter, so we have a pretty big delegation, which is cool not as big as some of the other ones. Um, this year, the convention is going to be online because of COVID. So you won't be traveling to a place with all of your comrades to, uh, you know, sit in the room and do Robert's rules all day and then, you know, have fun afterwards or whatever, but it's still going to be good. Um, so that, that kind of covers everything I was planning to say. If anyone has any questions briefly, I'd be happy to answer them, but I know I've kind of talked uh, too long. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Dave. Um, I will go ahead and include this link um, with convention updates um, in the agenda. It's not currently there, but it will be. Um, if you have questions, please um, join our Slack and ask there. Um, but we're going to continue to have more events about um, what convention is and, and how you can participate. So um, be on the lookout for those. So next, um, we'll have a campaign update from uh, Paul Steiner on the PRO Act, uh, one of the big national campaigns going on right now. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Paul Steiner. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I, too, am a member of uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, Local 520 here in town. Um, as y'all may know, National DSA is pushing really hard to get the protect the Right to Organize Act, the PRO Act for short, passed. Uh, this is the, the PRO Act is the most aggressive labor legislation that we've seen in decades. A bill that could repeal right to work federally, make union elections easier, and a whole other raft of things that will basically supercharge the American labor movement. As socialists, we know that the destruction of capitalism and the construction of a new socialist order is only possible through the activity of the working class. Uh, socialism is not something that is discovered by sociologists in ivory towers, and it's not an act of charity on behalf of the ruling class uh, run by non-governmental organizations, like uh, just like how Molly described in her uh, experience with joining the rank and file. Uh, socialism can only be won by the workers through the class struggle that was birthed the first time someone got paid for a day's wages. To that end, organizing the workers into unions, what Friedrich Engels called the school of war for the working class and making those unions stronger is of, ut uh, is of utmost importance. So you may be asking, how can I help? Uh, this week is DSA's national week of action. We're phone banking all week, basically every hour haranguing Democratic senators who are standing in the way of working class power. Are you getting bored of saying fuck you to Joe Manchin on Twitter? Are you getting tired of getting blocked by Neera Tandon after you post pig poop balls to her one too many times? What if I told you that you can make, make these people's lives miserable while helping the working class? On our calendar, you can find the phone bank shifts and where to sign up and basically all the information that you could ever dream of, of how to get on the horn with these senators and tell them to support the working class of America. And of course, May Day is approaching. Uh, International Workers' Day is a holiday all over the world, except for in America. And that's when a weekend of action is being called for by DSA. If you would like to help plan the weekend action for here in Austin, uh, we in, are in conjunction with our unions are in the process of figuring out what uh, we can do here to demonstrate that Austin's working class stands in solidarity 
with the rest of the workers in this nation on that weekend. If you are interested in that, uh, join the next labor branch meeting, uh, which is going to be on Monday at 7 p.m. And I will drop the RSVP link in the chat. Uh, and there, the, that I yield my time. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. That was great. I encourage everyone to uh, sign up to phone bank. Um, if you haven't done it before, this is a perfect opportunity because you will be calling other comrades and they are some of the friendliest people. They would love to hear from you. Um, so with that, we will kick it over to our restaurant organizing project um, organizers, Gina and Chris, to talk about the service worker vaccination campaign. There we go, I'm muted. All right, my, hey guys, my name is Chris. Um, I am one of the organizers with Austin DSA's Restaurant Organizing Project. Uh, we are a, a group of service industry workers and non-service industry workers um, trying to agitate the working class within the service industry, um, spread class consciousness, and eventually organize the restaurant industry. Um, so I, I want to start this off just, you know, giving people context of how fucking crazy this past month has been with uh, vaccines, mask mandates. Um, on March 2nd, um, in a moment of the fusion of the stupid culture war that is anti-maskers um, and the increasingly barbaric uh, class war that is waged on the working class, uh, Governor Abbott at a Mexican restaurant in Lubbock, Texas, announced that the mask mandate will be lifted on March 10th. Uh, so, for service workers and for essential workers in general, that is essentially um, a massive fuck you to us. Um, we have been faced with having to, to force to go back to work uh, because there weren't enough benefits to allow us to stay home um, and dealing with a constant, constant workplace hazards and aggressive and antagonizing uh, customers as well. Uh, so what we did as soon as we got the announcement is we mobilized uh, our group and we made a petition and we planned a rally for the following Monday that it was announced. So our petition got pretty good amount of signatures, uh, over 1100 uh, since today. Um, and the rally was a huge success. Um, we got a ton of media coverage from it. Uh, and we also received much ire from the right and the conspiracy theorists at our friends Infowars. Um, let's see, there's a picture of me telling, uh, one of the Infowars guys to, you know, kick dirt. Um, and we even got featured in the New York Times, which was really cool. And this rally was a success because uh, we've been organizing for a year. And within that year, we have been building strong community coalitions. And I think something that DSA is getting really good at and like Homes Not Handcuffs is an amazing example of that is how how like strong our community coalitions can be and how like how much power we have when we um when we team up with our community and it's great um yeah we got on the cover of the austin chronicle which was fantastic um so after a rally i think a day after a rally um austin reinstated the masks um of course Ken Paxton, our uh, um, attorney general, is trying to uh, reverse that. Um, but, you know, still doing what we can. On, um, I think a few weeks ago, Joe Biden announced that on May 1st, all adults in America will be eligible for the vaccine. And today, um, the Department of the State Department of Health and Safety um, have announced that 
um, everyone in Texas, all, sorry, all adults in Texas will be eligible uh, next Monday. Um, and yeah, so at our, at our petition and our rally, we demanded that uh, essential workers be prioritized. Um, we sort of got what we asked for, but not really. Um, right now it's a free for all for, in every man and person, every, every person for themselves uh, when it comes to getting vaccines. Uh, there's still huge accessibility issues and um, you know, there's still work that ROP needs to do in terms of uh, getting to awesome public health and prioritizing the appointments for people who work in customer facing shops who are still continue, continue to be forced and coerced to come into work uh, in putting themselves in a position of uh, danger. And I'm gonna pass it over to Gina. Yeah, hi. So let's see, can everybody hear me? I'm gonna be really quick. I just wanna follow up with um, this idea of getting involved uh, with ROP. So we will be having an upcoming um, organizing 101 training, like just a very basic general virtual uh, webinar about generally, um, about general organizing in your workplace. Um, and we, we really wanna like, you know, ride this wave of success from um, this vaccine campaign and the fact that we've gotten a lot of signatures and interest from workers. So we wanna offer workers the opportunity to get involved in this local labor fight, whether that's helping other workers organize in their workplace or joining a salting campaign. So this is gonna be a co-sponsored virtual webinar on April 19th. Um, we will be posting in all of the places as soon as we get um, you know, more of the details hammered out with it. Um, but this is going to be an upcoming event, a good place to sort of filter any workers that might be interested in learning more just about the labor fight and labor movement. Um, lots of opportunities available, job salting positions and um, worker organizing. So yeah, we'll be posting soon, April 19th, coming up. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been great to watch everyone mobilize um, for this campaign. And I'm so excited to see what y'all have coming next. Um, all right, so next up we have our defund and um, decriminalization committee or the Homes Not Handcuffs to defeat Prop B. Y'all are ready? Can I get screen sharing permission? You should have. Yeah, there you go. Can everybody see this, the screen? Cool. Sure can. All righty. Well, uh, hello, folks. My name is Preston Manis, he, him, a member at the DSA, relatively recent. I uh, work on the Homes and I Handcuffs Project Committee. It does what it says. I handle communications, uh, the website, social media. Um, we want to use homes and not handcuffs, take a housing first approach to homelessness in Austin. And Save Austin Now, our opposition has been fighting to get Prop B on the ballot for, a few, for over a year now. They succeeded. Uh, Prop B would undo the work we did in 2019. Uh, it would recriminalize homelessness in Austin. And how is this related to our past work? Uh, we have been a national leader on inter interrelated issues, uh, chief among them defunding the police, largest police defunding effort in the country that gave more budget for services. Because Homes Not Handcuffs had decriminalized homelessness, that budget had a place to go. It went to housing first initiatives. In addition to the decriminalization, we did district attorney, got Jose Garza elected, You know, a very good progressive strong DA that doesn't see incarceration as the first and only tool in the toolbox. In my opinion, we are living proof that a better world is possible and reactionary forces like SAN 
They know that, they're threatened by it. They have us and our work in their crosshairs because Save Austin Now's Prop B completely undoes all the work we did in 2019. I believe we have a moral obligation to remain that living proof. We need to defend our gained ground. If a defeat here is going to be a painful setback, uh, not just in Austin, but nationally. I won't read through all of this, but the, the uh, executive summary here is that we are making progress towards our win number, but we are off pace. Phone banks and text banks have proven very effective, but they're also expensive. So the big push we have here is getting more funds to run auto dialers and text banks. There's nearly 150 people on this call. If you all gave 20 bucks, our money problems would be substantially reduced. All right, thank you, Preston. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to stop Prop B from passing, but we are energized and we're not gonna let this um, momentum that we have built up behind decrim and defund, um, we're not gonna let that subside. So um, we're going to get an automatic dialer to call thousands of voters. Um, as Preston mentioned right now, our budget is pretty tight. We have budget for one of these big auto dialer events. So um, please donate if you can, so we can call the voters we need to. Um, we're partnering with Our Revolution and we're gonna call every single person in Austin who voted for Bernie in 2020 and tell them to vote no on Prop B. It's a lot of people. Um, we've got some canvases coming up with our coalition partners. D5 for Black Lives and Bend the Arc are just two of um, many coalition partners we have that um, we're gonna be doing canvases with. Um, we also have some get out the vote events during early voting with Texas Freedom Network, and we're gonna be doing vote tripling at the polls on election day. Um, so what do we need from you? We need your help. We need money. Um, Save Austin now has spent $300,000 on this election so far, and they're aiming to spend half a million. Um, you know, we can work really well with shoestring budgets because we have a really awesome group of volunteers, but we still need the money. Um, we need y'all to show up to events. Um, Austin DSA has been killing it with the pro act phone banks. We're like number eight in the country among chapters, even though like we're a pretty small city. That's cool. Um, so uh, we have a lot of events coming up this week and really every week up until May 1st. Um, you know, everyone's been building their skills with the pro act phone banks. We would love it if you could show up to um, some Homes Not Handcuffs events. We have virtual events, we have in-person events, so whatever, you know, meets your needs. Um, we need people to get out there and start, talk start talking to their neighbors as well. Um, you know your neighborhood, you can make that personal connection with people who live near you. We have some neighborhood canvases being set up in a lot of different neighborhoods, just a couple are Riverside, South Lamar, East Austin. If you want to host a canvas in your neighborhood, please let us know and we will help you get that set up and we'll get people out there to canvas with you. We also need y'all to talk to your friends and family and people you know in Austin. Get on Reach, which is the um, app that we're using to track um, you know, kind of how we're doing, how many votes we have and track that relational organizing. We're gonna put a link in the chat um, there's a link where you can sign up, um, get on social media, spread the word. People need to start hearing about this. A lot of people don't even know there's an election on May 1st. So we need, we need to start boosting this issue really hard and join us on Slack. Uh, keep in touch with the campaign. This is our, um, Slack channel name. Please come and join us. And we also have this link tree, which we're going to drop in the chat. There's a little summary of what we need you to do. And that's all I get. Let me stop sharing my screen. Hey, Grace, 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 where are we canvassing on Saturday? We're going to be at, we're going to meet up at Black Star Co-op. We have two canvas shifts. And after the second shift, we're going to do a little social ride. So y'all should show up, come knock on doors, then do a bike ride, have a beer or whatever you would like. And um, yeah, come and help us defeat these ghouls from Save Austin Now. Yes, amazing. Um, donate, go to the uh, canvases, phone bank. Um, this is huge. And um, not only will you, you know, protect uh, some of our most vulnerable people in the city, um, you'll get to do it with amazing comrades um, like Preston and Grace. So thanks, y'all.